together at this time to the book of Daniel chapter 4 and verse 1. Daniel 4 1 for our message from the Word of God this morning. You'll find Daniel 4 1 on page 904 in the church Bible. If that's what you're using today, today being February 7th, 2021, if you're joining us by recording at some later date. Today's text is going to be in Daniel 4, verse 1, right on down to the end of the chapter in verse 37. And the title of this morning's message is An Attitude Adjustment. An Attitude Adjustment. And we begin with the story of a mean, ornery, foul-mouthed man who died and left his pet parrot to his niece. When she took him home, she found out that he was just as mean and foul-mouthed as her uncle. And she tried to change his poor attitude by speaking politely to him and playing soft music in the house, but nothing worked. Finally, she had enough and started screaming at the bird. But he just screamed back. So in desperation, she grabbed him and threw him in the freezer and slammed the door shut. Where he continued to scream, but then he suddenly stopped. Thinking maybe that she had hurt the bird, she opened the freezer door. And the parrot said, Pardon me, miss, but I wish to apologize for my actions. And I promise I will try to correct my poor behavior. And as she was about to ask him what had brought about this attitude adjustment, he said, by the way, what did the chicken do wrong? <laughs> well, it's an old joke, but I thought it would introduce our subject well. Because here in Daniel chapter 4, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon is about to experience an attitude adjustment of his own. One that changed his life so dramatically that after it was all over, he made an official proclamation to everybody in his kingdom to tell them about it. And in this chapter, Daniel actually records that proclamation word for word. He quotes him. Beginning here in verse 3, I'm sorry, verse 1 to 3, where we read these words. Nebuchadnezzar the king, unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I thought 
thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Now, if you've been with us for this study of Daniel, or if you know your Bible, you know what signs and wonders he's talking about there. Back in chapter 2, Daniel was able to tell him what he dreamed and what his dream meant. Then last Sunday we saw in Daniel 3 that Nebuchadnezzar threw Daniel's three friends into a burning, fiery furnace. And God kept them from burning. And those signs and wonders convinced King Nebuchadnezzar that Daniel's God was God. And they convinced him that Daniel was right when he told the king that the only reason he was king of the world is because God had made him king of the world. Do you remember what Daniel told him in your first reference in Daniel 2.37? Daniel told the king, The God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. But, here in Daniel chapter 4, a lot of years have passed since he was convinced that God had given him his kingdom. And Nebuchadnezzar is about to get pretty full of himself <laughs> and start thinking that he was king of the world because he was just so doggone smart. Let's peek ahead to what he said about himself across the page in verse 30. Daniel 4 and verse 30, the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? <laughs> Well, that doesn't square with what God told him in chapter 2, does it? So as you can see, Nebuchadnezzar is in desperate need of an attitude adjustment. So God is about to start all over with him by giving him another bad dream. <laughs> as we see, as we read on now in your Bible in verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, still proclaiming this to the people, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. And why shouldn't he? God made him king of the world. But then he says in verse 5, I saw a dream which made me afraid. And the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers, and I told the dream before them. But they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. Now, here we have to ask, what was he thinking? <laughs> I mean, back in chapter 2 he dreamed a dream, and none of his soothsayers or magicians or astrologers had been able to interpret it. So, 
why would he round up the usual suspects <laughs> and, and ask them to try and interpret this new dream? Well, I think we see the answer to that question in the next two verses in your Bible, in verses 8 and 9. It says in verse 8, But at the last, after the soothsayers and guys couldn't interpret the dream, at the last Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And before him I told the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, Master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubleth thee, tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen, and the interpretation thereof. Now, here we see that the king has not forgotten about Daniel's ability to interpret dreams. But in verse 8, when he talked about the holy gods, plural, and when he said Daniel was named after his god, whose name was Bel, so he named Daniel Belteshazzar, Bel or Baal, name for the devil, by the way, that all shows that he had slipped back into idolatry if he never left it in the first place. And that's another reason why he needs an attitude adjustment. But now, did you notice that he asks Daniel two things? He says, first, tell me what I dreamed, and then tell me what the dream meant. Kind of like he did in chapter 2. But as we read on now in our Bibles in verse 10, we're going to see he must have been pretty agitated. <laughs> he must have been all shook up because instead of asking Daniel to, or waiting for Daniel to tell him what he dreamed like he just asked, he just launches into describing his dream in verse 10. Thus were the visions of mine head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. Now folks, trees in the Bible sometimes represent men, like you see in your next reference in Matthew chapter 7 verses 15 to 17 where the Lord said, Beware of false prophets. You'll know them by their fruits, like a fruit tree. Every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Well, folks, prophets are men. And so the tree there represents men. And the tree that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about is also going to represent a man. A man who eventually becomes a big and powerful man as we see, as we read on in verse 11. Where he says the tree grew and was strong and the height thereof reached unto heaven. And the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. Everybody on the planet knew about him, he says. The leaves thereof were fair. And the fruit thereof much. And it was meat or food for all. The beast of the field had shadow under it. And the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the branches, the boughs thereof. And all flesh was fed of it. Now here, you have to wonder if the king might have started thinking that maybe this tree represented him. 
Because after all, Daniel had told him in your next reference in Daniel 2.37, The God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, and wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beast of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand and made thee ruler over them all. Well, hey, doesn't that sound a lot like the tree he's dreaming of with the birds in the branches and the beasts underneath the branches? Now, the part of the dream that troubled the king and made him afraid, like it said there, starts in verse 13 where he learns that somebody's been watching this tree. In verse 13 he says, I saw in the visions of my bed upon my head... Uh, in, <laughs> let me start again. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. Now here we got to ask who this watcher is. Because whoever he is... This is the only time in the Bible that word watcher appears. So we can't know who he is by comparing Scripture with Scripture and finding some other verse that tells you what a watcher is. <laughs> but we know he's an angel for a couple reasons. First, he comes down from heaven, as it says. But... Look what it says in Genesis chapter 2, I'm sorry, Genesis 18 and verse 20 and 21. And the Lord said, Behold, the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great. And because their sin, their sin of homosexuality, is very grievous, watch now, I will go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it. He says, I'm going to go down there and see if it's as bad as, they're, as I'm hearing. Well, when you read on, you find out how the Lord went down to see how bad things were in Sodom. In verse uh, 19, the beginning of the next chapter, there came two angels to Sodom. In other words, the Lord used angels as His eyes and ears, as His watchers, right? Now, maybe you're thinking, well, why does God need watchers? <laughs> why does He need angels to be His eyes and ears? Doesn't He see and hear everything that goes on? Well, yes, He does. But he chooses to use angels to be his eyes and ears. And once you recognize that, you're not going to be puzzled by verses like Second Chronicles 16 and verse 9, which says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. That's talking about how angels run to and fro through the whole earth to see whose heart is perfect toward God. Every time I see that verse, I think of how years ago the president of Berean Bible Society, Pastor C.R. Stam painted that verse on a huge plaque. A plaque that still hangs at the office today. You come on up and I'll show you the plaque. And he told me one time the reason he put that verse up on the wall at the office is because if someone were to break in, maybe they would see the sign and it would make them think twice before stealing from a Bible society. Now, you might not think that would work, but you know, he also told me one time, a, a mafia guy, they were big in Elmwood Park, by the way, a mafia guy came in and offered to sell him protection for Brian Bible Society. 
And he says, I told him, well, the Lord protects us here. <laughs> and the guy just kind of, well, they shuffled out. <laughs> and that was it. So. But now, just so you know, to cover all the bases, Pastor Stam also had a burglar alarm installed at Brian Bible Society in those days. Well, anyway, let's read on to see what this watcher in Nebuchadnezzar's dream had to say in verse 14. In verse 14, this watcher cried aloud and said, Hew down the tree, cut that tree down, and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it, and the fowls from his branches. Now, if Nebuchadnezzar suspects that he's the tree, uh, he was probably uh, worried about all of this because <laughs> this can't be good news. Uh, it, 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 when it says that the beasts are going to leave, and the, well, that would mean he's about to lose control of all the men and all the beasts of the field that God made him ruler over. So he was probably glad that this watcher went on to say in your next verse, in verse 15, Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. If the king thinks that maybe he's the tree, he, he's probably glad to read that the stump of the tree is going to remain. Because he knew what you probably know about stumps. And that is, unless you, when you go to chop a tree down, unless you lay the axe to the root of the tree, you're not going to kill the tree. So, when this stump is left, Nebuchadnezzar is thinking, well, if I get cut down, at least I'm not going to die. <laughs> now, if you're not convinced that the tree represents a man, what the watcher says next will remove all doubt. Look at verse 16. Still talking about the tree, he says, let his heart be changed from a tree's heart. Is that what Gear says? If it is, it's a misprint. You need another version of the Bible. Let his heart be changed from a man's heart. And let a beast's heart be given unto him. And let seven times pass over him. When the watcher says that the tree's heart should be changed from a man's heart to a beast's heart, well, that tells us he has to be talking about a man, right? A man that's going to start thinking and acting like a beast for a period of seven times, it says there in verse 16. Now, we know that that's a way of saying seven years. Because the second half of the seven-year tribulation is called what in your next reference in Revelation 12, 14? A time and times and half a time, which adds up to a year, two years, and half three and a half years. So when it says the king's heart is going to be turned into a beast's heart for seven times. That's saying that he's going to go bonkers for seven years, folks. Now, just in case the, th the king thought he could weasel out of this, <laughs> look what the watcher went on to say in verse 17 in your Bible. This matter is by the decree of the watchers. So we know there's a lot of angels watching. And the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high God rules in the kingdom of men and gives it 
to whomsoever he will, like he did for Nebuchadnezzar, and set up, setteth up over it the basest of men. Now when it says that this matter is by the decree of the watchers, you might be thinking, well, who does this watcher think he is that he can go around making decrees? <laughs> well, don't forget, angels are just messengers who carry messages from God, right? So this decree came straight from the top, from God. The same God who many years earlier in your next reference set a really base man named Pharaoh over Egypt and all the world. Look at Exodus 9.16 where God told Pharaoh, For this cause have I raised thee up to show my power in thee when I rip Israel away from you, is the complete thought. And you know what? Here in Daniel 4, God set a base man named Nebuchadnezzar over the world. By the way, do you know what the word base means? I looked it up and it means lowly or of low value. Guys like Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar, they probably thought a lot of themselves, <laughs> but God didn't. Okay, the king is now finished telling Daniel his dream. So now he wants to know what it all means. Look back in your Bible now in verse 18. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now thou, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof. For as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation... But thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished. He was astonished for one hour. And as his thoughts troubled him, the king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof be to thine enemies. Now, notice that it doesn't say that Daniel was astonished for an hour. Does it? Let me put it this way. It doesn't say he sat there an hour and then was astonished. That's right. <laughs> if he sat there an hour and then all of a sudden he was astonished, that would mean it took him an hour to figure it out, right? No. He figured it out right away. And the interpretation that he got right away astonished him for an hour. And he didn't want to tell the king what it meant because it wasn't good news for him. When he said at the end of the verse there in verse 19, the dream be to them that hate thee and the interpretation be to your enemies, that's his way of saying the dream is good news for your enemies and bad news for you. So... It's tempting to think that Daniel waited an hour to tell him the bad news because he was afraid the king might kill the messenger <laughs> when he didn't like the message, right? And I suppose that could be the reason. But I think the, way, the reason he, he waited an hour to tell the king what his dream meant is because he loved the king and respected the king and he didn't want to be the bearer of bad news. And I think that because the king seems to sense this, as we see when he tells Daniel, don't be afraid to give me the interpretation, give me the bad news. So
So Daniel does in verse 20. The tree that thou sawest, O king, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto the heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king, thou art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Hew the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field, till seven times pass over him, this is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High who sent the watchers with that decree, which is come upon my Lord the King, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomsoever he will. Well, here we see that the king finds out he's the one that's going to start thinking and acting like an animal, eating grass like an ox, sleeping out in the pasture where he'd wake up in the morning wet with the morning dew. And he's the one that they're going to have to chain with chains of iron and brass so he doesn't go wandering off like oxen tend to do. This is your, their king. They had to do that for seven years. Now, Daniel doesn't say who the they are who are going to do all this. But it had to be the watchers, folks. Because no mere men could have driven Nebuchadnezzar off his throne, for one thing. And no mere men could have <laughs> made him be out there eating grass with a loss of his senses, his reason. And I think that this explains why Daniel was so astonished. Because I think in the ten years that passed since chapter 3 that we read about last week, where he raised that idol, that image, and commanded everybody to worship it, I think after that, for ten years, I think Nebuchadnezzar quit worshiping idols. And that's why Daniel was astonished as to why God would do this to him. He seemed to be straightened up and flying right. But these watchers, they had seen things that the king hadn't seen. I'm sorry, that Daniel had couldn't see. <laughs> As these watchers watched the king in his private life, they saw signs of that pride we saw and read about in verse 30 there. And that's when God gave the king that dream as a warning to him. But now, now that Daniel has given the king the bad news, <laughs> he gives him the good news in your Bible in verse 26. And whereas the watchers commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee after that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. 
when Daniel said his kingdom would be sure unto him, that's his way of saying that after the seven years of madness come to an end, he's going to get his kingdom back. And listen, I'm sure that went a long way toward making the, the king feel a whole lot better about this business because, listen, in any kingdom, there's always what we call young Turks hanging around the court, waiting in the wings, just waiting for their chance to seize the throne. And listen, if a king went mad for seven days, <laughs> let alone seven years, one of them would have grabbed Nebuchadnezzar's throne. So Daniel assures the king here, God's not going to let that happen. But now here you got to say, well, how is God going to keep that from happening? Because remember, I, I've told you often, God never interferes with a man's will. He never imposes his will on another man. On a man, I should say. And so how was he going to keep those young Turks from seizing the throne when they saw they had a mad king. Well, how I think it works is this. I think that when those Turks heard that the same God that predicted he would go mad also predicted that it would come to an end and he'd get his reason back, they didn't want to be the one sitting on the throne when he did make his comeback. <laughs> they knew that wouldn't end well for him. So I, th I think that's how God kept the young Turks from seizing the throne. Alright, now, having delivered the good news and the bad news, in verse 27 in your Bible, Daniel goes on to give the king some advice. He says, Wherefore, O king... Let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. Daniel tells him, you know, if you just straighten up and fly right, maybe God will reconsider and as we read on in the Bible, we see that it seems like he did straighten up and fly right for a little while anyway, but then his pride got the best of him. Look at verse 28. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months. So he evidently towed the line for 12 months. But at the end of the 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon and the king spake and said is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty and while the word was in the king's mouth there fell a voice from heaven saying O king Nebuchadnezzar to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomsoever he will. And you know what? Verse 33 says, The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from men. And he did eat grass as oxen. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven. Did you ever do that? Did you ever sleep outside? I remember as young people, and uh, we had a thing outside uh, overnight one time, and you wake up just wet from the dew of heaven if you sleep without. Uh, uh, this all, it took, took, and then look, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird claws. Now, here's 
the next part of the message. Becoming like a beast for seven years makes Nebuchadnezzar a type of the Antichrist in the seven year tribulation, folks. You know, the Antichrist was also called what? The beast. You'll notice that he becomes like an ox. Did you know that's the kind of beast that the devil's associated with? As you probably know, when God, God didn't create the devil as the devil. He didn't create a, an evil being. When God created the devil, He created him an angel. But He created him a certain kind of angel. He created him a cherub. Look what God told Satan in Ezekiel 28, verses 13 and 14. He says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Well, who was, with, who was in Eden? Was it, it was Adam and Eve and, and the devil, right? Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. So the devil, he, he started out as a cherub, folks. And did you know the cherub were oxen? You say, how do you know that? Well, we know it by comparing two visions that Ezekiel saw. Look at uh, the first one in Ezekiel 1, 4 to 10. He says, I looked and behold the likeness of four living creatures. And every one had four faces. Remember this now. The face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. Now, compare that to the vision he saw of that same creature in Ezekiel 10.14. He's describing him now, and he says everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. And the second face was the face of a man. And the third face, the face of a lion. And the fourth, the face of an eagle. Now you take those verses home and compare them and you'll notice that the only difference there is that the ox is called a cherub. And the cherub is called an ox. See how the Bible defines a cherub as an ox. You know, after Satan got Eve to sin, in your next reference, did you ever wonder why God said to Satan in Genesis three fourteen, Because you've done this and tempted Eve to sin, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Folks, Satan was a beast. He was a cattle, which, by the way, my dictionary says includes oxen. Now, think about the book of Exodus. Does that give you any idea of what a heinous thing it was when the Jews worshipped a golden what? Calf. It was devil worship, folks, in the wilderness. And can you see how Nebuchadnezzar was a type of the Antichrist when he became an ox? Now, if you're not convinced of that, notice that Nebuchadnezzar is described as a beast with hair like an eagle's feathers, there in verse 33 in your Bible, and nails like a bird's claws. Did you know that in the Bible birds are not good things? Do you remember what the Lord said in the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, 4-19? He said, A sower went forth to sow. And you know, it was sowing the seed of the Word of God. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. And then he goes on to tell you what the parable means. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, because the sower sows the seed, and understandeth it not, then cometh the fowls. Is that what you're saying? Well, no, but that's what it means. Then cometh the wicked one, the devil, 
and catcheth away the seed of the Word of God that was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. Folks, the birds there represent the devil. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about the parable in your next reference in Luke 13, 18? Where the Lord said, the kingdom of God is like a great tree and the fowls of the year lodged in the branches of it. But listen, the, the birds there don't represent saved people. They don't represent believers. Look what the Lord said a few verses later in your next reference in Luke 13, 20 to 21. Again he said, The kingdom of God is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. And folks, if you know your Bible, you know leaven is a type of what in the Bible? Sin. You see, for the first thousand years of that kingdom, it's going to be filled with sinners. It's going to start out with nothing but believers. But then those believers are going to have kids. Kids who also have to believe for themselves to be saved. And I don't have to tell you, most people don't believe the gospel and get saved. So all of those unbelieving kids are going to have more kids. And pretty soon you know what happens? The whole lump of the kingdom is leavened. Just like Paul says happens in 1 Corinthians 5, 6. A little leaven does what? Leavens the whole lump. That's why the psalmist said in Psalm 110, 2, The Lord will send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. In the first thousand years of that kingdom, the Lord's going to rule over his enemies on this planet. And that explains what John said in Revelation 19, your next reference, verses 7 to 9. When the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosed out of his prison and go out to deceive the nations and the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is just a few. Is that what you're saying? No! The number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured it. By the end of that thousand years, by the end of that millennium, unbelievers will be as numerous as the sand of the sea. So God's going to have to snuff them out. And after that, no more birds in the branches of the kingdom. Do you see how birds are not a good thing in the Bible? If you're not convinced... Hold here. I know we usually I have things on the reference sheet. Look at Revelation 18. There's a verse I forgot to put on there until the last minute this morning. So look at Revelation 18. And, and by the way, if you're a bird lover, don't come crying to me. You know, don't kill the messenger just because you don't like the message. I remember years ago I wrote an article in the brand Searchlight where I talked about killing two birds with one stone. <laughs> And some sweet lady wrote in to ask me why I had to talk about killing birds. <laughs> well, look at Revelation 18 and verse 1. In Revelation 18, 1, After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory, and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful what? Bird. Do you see how the birds there are associated with devils? Foul spirit. Antichrist kingdom, which is called Babylon, 
is going to be filled with devils, all serving the head bird, the Antichrist. Folks, after you and I ra are raptured, the world is going to be under the dominion of a bird-like beast for seven years. Just like back here in Daniel chapter 4. And for seven years, this world is going to be ruled by a madman. Just like you're seeing pictured in Babylon in Daniel 4. But now, as we read on in Daniel chapter 4, what happens next is probably going to make you think that your pastor's full of baloney for thinking that Nebuchadnezzar is a type of the Antichrist because in verse 34 it says, And at the end of the days, Nebuchadnezzar still proclaiming to his people what happened to him. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven. And mine understanding returned to me. That's how you know he lost his marbles. And I blessed the Most High. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. He got the message. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And nobody, none can stay his hand or say unto him, What do you think you're doing? What doest thou? So as you can see, once the days of the seven years are up, Nebuchadnezzar snaps out of it. And he starts to bless God. So how can he be a type of the Antichrist? I mean, the Antichrist is going to end up in the lake of fire cursing God. Well, don't forget that in the tribulation there's going to be more than one Antichrist. In your next reference, the Apostle John wrote to Jews who would have entered the tribulation if the dispensation of the mystery hadn't interrupted all this. And look what John wrote to those folks who would have gone into the tribulation in 1 John 2.18. Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are what? Many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Now, as we said in our scripture reading this morning in Ephesians 3, this the last time was interrupted <laughs> by the dispensation of the mystery, but as you can see, the followers of antichrist are also called antichrists. And do you know what else they're called in your next reference? 2 Peter 2.12 Natural brute what? Beasts! And you know what Jude called them in Jude 1.8 and 10? Filthy dreamers. Well, isn't that interesting in the light of our dreams in Daniel? Filthy dreamers. Brute beasts. And folks, there's going to be a new batch of brute beasts in the tribulation following the Antichrist. And you know what? If they don't take the mark of the beast, they can get saved and they can come out of the tribulation blessing God like Nebuchadnezzar. That's how Nebuchadnezzar can be a type of the Antichrist. Even though he ends up... Um, uh, you know, not being in the kingdom. Well, once the king realizes <laughs> what the message God's been trying to tell him, that he's in charge, verses 36 and 7, the last verses of our text say, At the same time, when I realized that, my reason returned unto me. And for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me. And my counselors and my lords sought unto me. 
And I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. Now I can't be sure, folks, but I think Nebuchadnezzar gets saved here. Because I think, I think after all of that, he finally followed Nebuchadnezzar's advice in... No, I'm sorry. He finally followed Daniel's advice in your next reference in Daniel 4.27. Remember Daniel told him, Break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by doing what? By showing mercy to the poor. And if he did that, I think he got saved. Because folks, that's what men who are, are going to have to do in the tribulation to get saved. Just like the Lord told people who were going into the tribulation in Luke 18. He said a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what do I do to inherit eternal life? And the Lord told him, Sell what you have and what? Distribute to the poor. That's what they did at Pentecost. And that's what Antichrist beasts are going to have to do to be saved in the tribulation. And you know what? If that's what Nebuchadnezzar did, I think he got saved. And you know what? I think that means that someday you'll get to ask him just exactly how much weight he lost on the oxen diet. I think I'd like to try the oxen diet. And you ladies... You ladies might want to ask him how he kept those long nails from breaking. You know, you get your nails nice and long and they're always breaking them. But now, one more thing. If you think that... Well, let me ask you this. I want you to think about the last words of the chapter there, the very last words of verse 37 when it says, Those that walk in pride, he is able to abase... A uh, base. Those who are walking in pride, he is able to make low. And that what base means? Because listen, folks, here's something really, really practical you could take out of this. Pride will abase you, just like it did Nebuchadnezzar for seven years. It'll ruin. Pride will ruin your life faster than just about anything. Back in the days when door-to-door -door salesmen used to knock on your door. How many of you remember those days? Remember, raise your hand if you can remember a door-to-door -door sale. Back in the days when door-to-door -door salesmen used to knock on your door to sell you all kinds of things. I read about one of them that did better at it than any of the rest of his salesmen on his crew. And you know what his pitch line was? He'd knock on your door and he'd say, Ma'am... Let me show you something that your neighbor said you can't afford. Well, can you see why that would make him the most successful sale? <laughs> that woman's pride would say, Well, I'll show them that I can afford what they can afford. Pride will make you buy things you can't afford. Pride will make you do things you shouldn't do. And wouldn't do if you didn't let pride go to your head like Nebuchadnezzar did. So instead of doing what Nebuchadnezzar did and looking at your life and thinking to yourself, is not this great life that I have built by the might of my power? Instead, you ought to wake up in the morning and just thank God for everything you have. Amen? Amen. But listen, pride will keep you out of heaven too. Do you know that? There's people who are so proud, they think that they're good enough to go to heaven just because they're such good people. If you're thinking like that this morning, let me tell you, pride will keep you out of heaven. Let me ask you, think for a moment. Don't say it all out. Think for a moment what it is exactly you're trusting to get you to heaven. Think about it. 
Because if your answer is anything other than Jesus Christ paid for my sins when He died for them on the cross, that's you just being proud. And you need to start trusting Him for your salvation and not what you're doing or what you're not doing. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that You've given us this glimpse into the life of this mighty King that You put in power. And we pray, Father, we might learn the lessons that He had to learn, talk about the hard way, by seven years. I suppose some of us have been battling pride. Well, all of us have been battling it all our lives. But Father, help us to learn the lesson this morning. Help us to remember to walk thankfully instead of proud. Thankful for what you've given us. And we pray it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.